been doing at school. Yeah, we're live. Hooray. So then I said, what do you mean we're out of butter? Oh. <laughs> How's everybody today? Pretty good. Hi, guys. Thomas, you're running the show. You started this thing. Um, right. <laughs> so uh, the first thing on the agenda is remaining issues for 1.1. And there are three things remaining, two of which are pull requests. Yeah, and one's a pull request to close the one that's not a pull request. Yeah. So is the... Really. Is there anything we need to discuss about these? I see this one with restore bytes. Miller said he'll merge if he doesn't hear from anyone. Yeah, Brian said he would review it. I don't, I'm not sure if that's happened. It has not. The uh, video calls have uh, yeah. <laughs> kept me fairly busy. <laughs> yeah, um, so do you want me to just describe what it does? That, that would actually be helpful, and then, then I can look at it. So, essentially, there was some confusion in what the notebook format really is in terms of what binary data should be represented as. Okay. And should it be, um, when we were initially creating it, that is, um, should it be, you know, should PNG output be, be raw PNG data or should it be base64 encoded text? And... We figured out it, it should just be base64 encoded text, but for some reason we were still coercing it back to base64 encoded bytes, which causes occasional Unicode issues when in various circumstances. So now basically this this PR just takes um, that, and so now now there should be no more bytes objects in. And be format anywhere at all. So ev everything is base64 encoded text. Right. So yeah, it doesn't change the content of anything. It just changes the um, data type. Right. And and it's actually less code because what we were doing is um, we were reading from JSON and then we were coercing base64 text down to base64 bytes which is a weird thing to do. <laughs> and then there's there's code in elsewhere to handle the ambiguity of, I just got some bytes. Are they base64 bytes or are they real bytes? That, that didn't go away because that can still technically happen. But, um, and, then, and then I changed, there, was, there were a bunch of calls to Unicode on a thing. And I changed those to cast Unicode. Okay because Unicode on some things won't do what you actually want it to do. So is this one in the display protocol when we create PNG data or binary data is that and we send those back to the browser are those base64 encoded bytes or text? In the Python API, it's bytes. Okay, it is bytes. That's what, that's what I PNG thought. PNG data. But to go what it, and so once that gets to, it's time to turn it into JSON and go over the wire. Then we uh, be, uh, make it base64 text. Right. And, and we do that. We do that in such a way that if it if the conversion had happened earlier it's okay okay and 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 actually can you what exactly do you mean by base 64 encoded text i mean it's a it it is a in python 2 it is a unicode object in python 3 it is a uh, stir object it, it is, is a never a bytes object okay just cuz 
text is the only um, the only unambiguous term to me. <laughs> right, te text. I, I use text in bytes because everything else Unicode <laughs> is deprecated and stir is ambiguous. And, yeah. Okay. Okay. Text as opposed to bytes is all I mean. And so when, when notebooks get sent back, I mean, it, it, there's sort of this odd path that, that all this data goes on. It starts out in Python, it goes over to the browser, and then it comes back to the server and gets saved on disk. Right. When it comes back, it's still A64 encoded text. Yeah, basically the only time there's a transform is the first time it becomes JSON, is the first time binary data becomes JSONable. Okay. And then it doesn't change Ever. any um, from kernel to browser, and then browser to server to file system. Um, it doesn't change. It's base okay. sixty four encoded everywhere else. It's just um, it's just from in memory. I got a PNG data. It's raw PNG data that you've done with with code. So not from the notebook. Not from the notebook. Just in code in the kernel. That's the only time that it's not base64 encoded. And then everywhere else it should be base64 encoded. What if someone creates a notebook by hand Yes. and does base64 encoded bytes? Uh, they'll be cast to Unicode. Okay, so we handle that? Yeah. Okay. I, can add, I can add a test for, for that specific case if you want. But. I think that's actually pretty likely someone would do that. And it's base64 encoded bytes. I guess I'll do I'll do both. But yeah, yeah. Why don't you add those tests? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll look over the pull request. That that helps though. And does this have any influence on either opening old notebooks or in the new notebooks that this creates? Will the old things to be able to open them. Yes, it's fine. It's just essentially, I mean, it doesn't change any of the content of the data. It's just it was a stir object in Python 2 and because it's an ASCII string, right? So yeah. there's, very, there's very little that an ASCII string, if you, if you treat it like a Unicode object, right. it'll be, you know, it works fine. It's just we, there hadn't been enough until NB convert. There wasn't much code that worked with notebook objects, and so and it did it wrong. <laughs> so um, that it so if you have PNG data, um, you'll get the B prefix um, mm -hmm. in NB convert because of a bug because it assumes it's Unicode or it assumes it's a stir, but it's actually bytes and it should be a stir. Okay. Great. So, so yeah, so there there might be workarounds. If anybody is doing manipulation of notebook objects in memory in Python three, they may have workarounds for the fact that it's a bytes, but that um, yeah, that should be something that's just fixed in one point one. And I, I doubt that there is any such code actually. Great. So then the other issue is these adjustments to Markdown and REST templates. Yeah, so um, Matthias opened an issue that um, HTML output is the highest priority in both REST and Markdown, but it's, um, there's no representation of HTML output in the templates. Um, and also LaTeX all that was always handled wrong um, because um, it was adding dollar signs when it should have been it was adding dollar signs where it should have been removing dollar signs um, and and things like this okay but um, and then yeah and then the only other thing I did was I removed the I removed the prompts from the output in REST and Markdown because the way they were displayed, I can't imagine anybody actually wanting that. How, how were they displayed? They were just, they got a line of their own with the prompt. So you got like in, so you'd have, you know, here's the in prompt, and then here's like a 
and then here's a, a, a code block, and then here's an app prompt, and then another code block. So what? So uh, we can talk more about this, but in Jonathan's LaTeX refactor, he has a couple new styles for formatting code cells. One of the styles does uh, traditional IPython prompts. The input area is done by just indenting, you know, adding the prompt spaces and the in bracket characters to the code. The out prompts are done so that if the output is text, it's put, it's indented, and the normal IPython out prompt is put next to it. If yeah. the output is other formats, the prompt is printed and the output is below it. So, like, if, yeah. there's, a, if, if there's a picture or, you know, something like that. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I would be surprised if anybody wants the like interleaved prompts ever. <laughs> um, so I, if if you want to put if you want to put those those prompts uh, in in the plane because this I mean this PR is for fixing bugs because. You know, LaTeX and HTML output right. um, do not work in 1.0 in restructured text or uh, Markdown. Yeah. Um, so that's the main reason it exists. And then I, I added, I removed the prompts because it's because they, they look horrible. <laughs> yeah. So so actually, uh, you can see what this looks like. I mean, it may make sense in a LaTeX document. It, it doesn't make any sense in a Markdown document or a restructured text document. It's like, if, yeah. if you want prompts, you should be using an IPython, you know, source code IPython directive, or, you know, or it should be, you should be adding it, at like like you do, um, adding the, the, the prompts and continuations. Um, and I think that's appropriate, but not for this PR, because that depends on a feature that's new after one prompt that won't yeah. be backported. Ah, so but yours is... You're, this is a backported, yeah. yeah. Um, here, let me let me pull this up. So, paste into hip chat request where Jonathan has pasted screenshots of what this looks like. You scroll down. Um, we, we can talk, I wa or I want to talk more about this pull request, but um, the, the style is called IPython cell style. Yeah. Do you think that's a, a reasonable approach? So, yeah, for LaTeX. Okay. Gotcha. No, I I agree. The interleave prompts in Markdown look sort of silly. And I mean, the block exists, so I I just think it's it's you know it's a it's a it's a sensible default. It's not like we're removing support for prompts. The block exists. It's just by default empty rather than by default. And so, and the other thing I changed is that um, instead of using triple backtick, I used um, indent for code cells. There's two logical options for me for uh, a code cell, and that's um, triple backtick Python for GitHub flavored style with highlighted Python. Yep. And there's uh, just indent, which because the GitHub flavored highlight isn't actually part of Markdown. Right. Um, and so it's just kind of a question of whether we want our default behavior to depend on GitHub-flavored Markdown, um, or do we want our default behavior to be more like default Python? Probably just the default Python. Okay. That, then that's what I did. Yeah.
Okay, then I think that PR is fairly straightforward. Okay. Do we want to talk about the, the LaTeX PR? Sure. So, um, Jonathan, why don't you run us through what you've done? Okay. Um, so, wait, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's the first time I talked, so. Uh, yeah, so Brian and I set about trying to separate all the LaTeX mess, and it was kind of inspired by all that vertical spacing stuff. Um, and what we ended up doing is kind of strange. Um, if you go to that link that Brian and I posted, there's a, a little diagram that kind of shows how the inheritance works. And we had a couple options. One, um, or we looked at a couple of options, but found out we only had one. Um, one was to do some sort of um, like filter method to choose the cell style to actually um, insert the cell style, but then we would lose the ability for the cell style to override. Hold on, hold on one second, just to give everyone a bit of background. So there's different LaTeX templates, and then we were starting to have different styles of representing code cells, and we want to be able to mix and match the code cell styles and the LaTeX document styles. So you might want a, a LaTeX Sphinx class article with black and white Python, standard Python props for your code cells. Or you might want to use a, a standard LaTeX report with the fancy notebook style formatting. And so figuring out how to mix and match these different things is the, is the problem we were trying to solve. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the problem with, with doing that with filters um, or, you know, any other method, the, the problem that we kept encountering is that Jinja has a weird template inheritance scheme where um, the blocks inherit correctly, but macros inherit in reverse. And we weren't able to get, um, using any traditional inheritance schemes, we weren't able to allow the cell styles to um, override Jinja blocks in the null template and then allow templates inheriting the built-in templates to override the way that the outputs were rendered, which was required for different types. You know, for example, for the Sphinx, you want to change how some things are rendered. Um, so what we ended up doing is that there's this, this, this feature in Jinja that allows you to conditionally inherit so we allow the user to set a Jinja variable before inheriting from the base class. And then the base class checks if that variable, which specifies what the cell style template is, has been set or not. And if not, it uses a default. And then it inherits from that uh, file specified by the cell style variable. <clears throat> um, so we added a couple things. There's an abstract template, which just contains a, a very generic outline of what we think that all LaTeX um, templates should look like. And then there's a base, LaTeX base, which includes um, a minimal amount of code to render um, like image output, code output, um, different different things just to get the multimedia, the render, and LaTeX. And then cell styles inherit from that base. That's where the conditional inheritance comes into play. And then below the cell styles, you would have the different built-in templates. Um, so like report, article, Sphinx report, Sphinx article, and whatnot. So in the PR itself, um, everything, of course, is in the templates slotex subfolder. Um, all the cell styles are suffix with underscore style. 
and all the templates are prefixed with LaTeX. I also ended up modifying the um, make file that automatically makes the um, null template and display priority template from the standard templates. I extended it so that it works with um, multiple files if necessary. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. And it needs it needs lots of look and review. Yeah. Oh, well, I forgot to mention, actually. So with the, the notebook style stuff um, and the vertical spacing, I ended up just scratching the whole MD frame design that we were having trouble with the vertical spacing and alignment issues on multiple computers. Um, I looked into distributing MD framed or, like, you know, keeping um, a, a specific version or forcing a specific version, but... It turned out that in order to do that, we would have had to modify the MD frame files themselves. So we decided that was not a viable solution. So instead, what I ended up doing is implementing all the notebook um, style from scratch in ticks. But we don't use that as a default. So that's just, just an option that's available. But as a default, we use the IPython still style. So, yep, that's it. OK. Um, yeah. This is big and complicated. Um. Yeah, I'm I'm concerned at how complicated it is. Brian, were you trying to say something? Your mic I don't think is on. <laughs> Did you catch all that? <laughs> <laughs> None of it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was talking to myself, yes. Oh, good. So I was saying that part of the motivation for this was to create cell styles that would pass muster at journals. So, for example, if you want to submit a paper to physical review, the big physics journals, they would not allow the, the fancy law tech that does the syntax highlighting. You really need just raw text shoved into verbatim for something like that. And so we wanted there to be a, a nice sort of wide selection of these cell styles to cover the different options. And we also wanted a default that we're pretty much guaranteed is always going to work. It's not going to be wonky and have weird spacing issues ever. And so that's why the, the new default is this uh, IPython cell style that just indents things. It doesn't try to do fancy layout with boxes or ticks or MD framed. And um, so if I wanted to ignore, I'm just trying to think because with kind of the point of the blocks is that they're reusable. If I wanted to write my own cell style that reused a block that's defined, all right, what, what blocks do we have? Right. Let's say I want to take the notebook cell style and I want to do the same thing, but I want to just add some content. What would be the process of doing that? You could just write your own file, any name you want, and then um, inherit from that notebook style. And then in that, you need one more file, the, the, the end template, and then that template you could choose. I mean, I well, okay. There's two things. If you if you're just using one end template, then you only need one template, right? So you can override it from a top level and just output that. If you want your cell style to work for all the templates without modifying it, then you need to inherit from the cell style that you're overriding and then specify that cell style when you want to use it. 
So I can't specify my own cell style. No, you can only you, clobber. No, 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 you can. You can. You can do either. You can clobber or specify your own cell style. It's just the way you do either is different. So I, I think we should probably have an example of this in the NB Convert Examples repo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the other big change with this is that we, the old uh, Sphinx uh, preprocessor used to have all these variables, config equals true variables, author name, release, all that. We've gotten rid of all that, and all that stuff has uh, blocks in the template. So basically, we're, we're really, really trying to go in the direction of telling people customization is through templates, not the, con not the config system. Um, I like, that's good. Yeah, so that, that's... And, and then the other thing is the... the uh, previously, the basic LaTeX template was completely separate from the Sphinx template. All those things are now unified, and the output of the LaTeX article uh, template is sort of the standard basic LaTeX that you would expect. About the only change we make is that we increase the margins to one inch on all sides, uh, so there's more room for code. But it, it, it's a, a very standard LaTeX look, but you can use the different cell styles. So. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Any thoughts? I'm, I don't know. The the graph inheritance <laughs> yeah. is I, <laughs> I I don't like that at all. Um but I don't I mean I I guess I'm I'm a little bit I'm a little bit surprised that it's not um, right because you could have in one template defining have all of this defined and not called right just in blocks. Mm -hmm. Right, yep. there's an IPython cell style block, and then the only logic you need is how to implement the switch for if cell style is this call this block. Uh, but but the missing piece, Min, is that Jinja does not allow you to define blocks that are not rendered. It doesn't allow you to define a block that's ignored? Exactly. Like in, you're, you're thinking about in the base style to have the different blocks for each of the styles yeah. and then later use them? Yeah. It, it, it doesn't allow that. It, it, you the okay. block there in the base template, it's rendered always. <laughs> so it'll error if it's not in the tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that and, and we, we we tried all those variants okay. and it, it We even tried some really exotic variants. Yeah. More exotic than this. <laughs> yeah. Would it help if I I described the issue? So I, I don't really. No, I, I the think that's. I, I... In, in, in this, the syntax for choosing a different cell st cell style is is fairly simple once you see it, um, and and he can. Yeah, no, I said it's a set set cell style equals. The, yeah. I, um, Yeah, a couple of examples for just picking cell styles and customizing. And There's a PR know, for that. I mean, the mainly, I yeah, I I opened that recently. Um, um, I don't know. Part of it is just I'm concerned about the maintainability of something this elaborate and complicated. Um. But the, I mean, have you looked at the actual templates? Yeah, 
Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm looking at them all right now. Okay. I mean, I, I, I think overall the templates themselves are fairly simple. Um, I mean, it. Th there's definitely complexity overall, but I, I don't know. I, it's the the thing that we wanted to avoid was having to have a, yep. a, a larger number of of templates, namely the number of cell styles times the number of. Yeah. No, we don't want. We don't want that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, the non. Yeah, I, did, I didn't know that you couldn't define blocks that you don't use. That's that's yeah. horrible. Uh -huh. um, I yeah, I mean that that's that's bad yeah. enough that I wouldn't like I wouldn't object to Jinja Master being a hard dependency if if we could fix that. Well, and the thing that's interesting is I think their idea is that macros. Do yeah. that. Okay. The, pro the problem is, is that macro inheritance goes in the opposite direction. So the first macro defined overrides uh -huh. the last macro yes. defined. Yes. Exactly. That's that's the whole crux right there. I mean, that, that's what a macro is for. It's for, for a bit of Jinja code that you want to reuse in different contexts, but it doesn't render anything unless you actually call it. And by, so by inheritance, I mean, it doesn't inherit. You can't call super in a macro, can you? But it, it it's... I, uh, I mean, I th it sounds like, really, you can just define a macro once. You can't redefine a macro. Uh, you you can, well, but it will have no effect. <laughs> exactly. That, that, so that, so yes. you, the answer is you can't. Exactly. The, the first okay. defined macro wins. Okay. Yep. So so then there's just a a ginger issue if you can't redefine macros. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, it sounds like if you could redefine macros, the way we're doing it now is not how we would want to do it. Right? Uh, e yes. That if, if redefining macros were available, we would rewrite this to use macros? Um, I'm not 100% convinced, but I think we would probably attempt it and see how it looked. Yeah. Okay. But I could imagine this same design pattern coming up in other output formats where you know someone wants to customize a component of it in different ways that's independent of the template, the main template itself. So what, one thing that kind of made more sense that we, we tried doing too was um, actually just overriding the box and having it in a separate file and then using like an include or an imports to pull that file in to the mm -hmm. template, but you can't define blocks. And, and like, if you define those blocks in that template, it's the same problem that Brian was saying. Yeah, since those yeah blocks you need to use if, in the yeah. tree. If you want that, you need macros or what they call that. Or yeah. Yeah. Blocks, yeah, 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 yeah. Blocks you might not use are macros. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. So and then I, I mean. It's, it's not super terrible if you read through each template. They're actually pretty small and pretty separated. I, I would say it's it's a little bit simpler than what it was before. Yes. It's actually, I, I think... It's just a lot of file systems. There's so many of them. Yeah, that's the yeah. only thing is that... Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I, I have two, two style-related pull requests that I at least want to run by because there's two subtle things. I'm going to paste them into HipChat. So here's the first one. So 
a while back, uh, we created an issue for some style-related things, and one of the issues that came up in that discussion is that we are left justifying our law tech in uh, markdown cells, which is completely the opposite of what's done in uh, most mathematical writing, where it's centered. And yeah. the, the original, the reason I made that choice originally is that our output is left justified, and the, the sort of compromise was to continue to left justify the math and the law tech output, but to indent it so that it matches the indentation level of our output. And um, I have a, a screenshot on that pull request that I posted yeah. that shows mm -hmm. what, what it looks like. And so the first question is, do we like that? Yeah, it's... it's Paul doesn't. Paul doesn't? Does not. I mean, well, yeah. I, wh why not just keep it centered? It's not centered. It's left justified at the, no, no. At the edge. No, no, I know. But why, why not make it centered is what I mean. Uh, why, why not... If you look at output convention? with uh, matplotlib figures and math, it looks really weird to have only the math centered. Yeah, it, it... Right, so if you have figure over here, equation over here, text here, um, it looks funky. Yeah. But it, it makes... I mean, we can... It's, it's easy to draw up screenshots of the various options of centering math and leaving math aligned with all the other outputs. I mean, because this will look weird... When you if you put just an image right, it, it it'll have the same issue. Yeah. Um, if you put so the image will be left justified also. Right. If you put an image in Markdown. Yes, that's uh, absolutely. So um, basically, with this, it will have the same inconsistency issue. Um, right. So this will look centered as long as you're. Uh, window is a certain width, and all your equations are the same length. Yeah, um, but it, but it's a it's a very difficult thing because there you're right that there are other things that are left justified. Uh, code blocks in Markdown cells are going to be left justified. Images are left justified, um, and so it it and it you know in in normal mathematical writing. You don't have code output like this where the everything is going to be left justified. So doing the center justified is, you know, your yeah, I, I, the logical choice. I I would think that the two most logical choices are to treat LaTeX specially and make it centered. Mm -hmm. or to treat LaTeX the same as other output and leave it left justified. Mm -hmm. Because right now, LaTeX is treated inconsistently in that it's indented, but other rich content images and things are not in Markdown. Right, so LaTeX in Markdown is handled inconsistently from everything else. Yes. So, and it seems like it... If we're going to treat LaTeX in differently, we should just center it. Would you, would you also center LaTeX output then? I mean, this, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's um, like there's this complex web of uh, choices. I don't know. I mean, like, I, if I were writing a latex -y thing, I would probably add CSS that centers images too. Right? Well, and, and this is the other choice. I mean, we, we, we can 
we can make consistency between LaTeX and other rich media in Markdown cells. We, we, we could center all those things. I mean, Yeah, I'm wondering if that makes sense. The, the problem, yeah. So there's there's two level there's two levels of consistency, right? There's consistency in Markdown within yep. Markdown. Yep. Um. And then there's consistency f across Markdown and output to um output. Oh, Fernando said. I'd keep that together with the rest of code, but it's definitely an awkward call. Can you clarify, Fernando? Oh, he's been he's been hip chatting because he's yeah. got a flaky connection. And it's a forty second delay or something, so it'll yeah. be a while before he's <laughs> okay. you're back um, from. I generally end up manually always centering my images and markdown with center. Yeah. Would we be able to do that for markdown? Oh yeah, I mean we. Yeah, yeah just add can... CSS one line of CSS for image tags and mark, and you're done. Yeah. Like it's. Um. So I I would maybe give that a try, of just um. Of centering images and equations in Markdown. Yes, and then see what to do if we should change it. I, I maybe it's just a lifetime of terminal IPython that makes me feel <laughs> this way, but it seems it seems weird for input and output um, for output to be centered. Yes. I I I very much agree with that. Um, yeah, I mean, but we, yeah, I would. That would be my first thing to try. Would be to leave output alone and try centering both images and equations in Markdown. Okay. Right, because uh, the margin is a bit. I don't know. It. It seems. I don't think it looks great, but it also seems like it might be a little bit fragile. It's actually fairly. It, I'm the way that the uh, prompt area is sized and its width is in X units, and yeah. I actually size the the left margin in the same X units, so it, it's gonna... the same X units by using a less variable. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, if we do go this way, Fernando it's, agrees it's with what like... Min said. Uh, um, no, yeah, it's it, there's no less variable, but I can add yeah. that. Um, but if you're centering it, then there then there won't be one. But yeah, I would yeah. I would give I would give centering everything in Markdown and leaving output alone. Okay, would be the, can... the next permutation I would try. Okay, I, I can absolutely do that. And then the other thing that you'll notice in this screenshot. And I think it's been there all along, is that um, LaTeX in an output cell is bigger font size than LaTeX in a Markdown cell. And I tracked this down to. Math of course Jack. you did. <laughs> so what? When MathJax renders math, it inspects the surrounding DOM elements and the size of them and tries to make smart choices about how big the math should be. This is not something we can control. Do you know mechanically how it works? I don't. Okay. I, I've not looked that far, far in depth. The main difference right now is that in a markdown cell, math gets wrapped in a P tag, whereas in the output cell, there is no P tag that we're wrapping it in. It's not clear. Well, I don't think putting it in a P tag is enough to get the fonts exactly the same. I think MathJack, and I've tried some tests, and it, it helped, but it didn't solve the problem. And so I don't, I don't know if we just want to accept this or if we want to try to start 
wrapping our math and output areas in the appropriate tags to trick MathJax into sizing it the same. Yeah, and there's also, um, did you look into MathJax config? I did a little bit, yeah. Okay. I mean, th th there are some config variables that influence this. Uh-huh. Um, but I think it's going to... Yeah. Yeah, so one one thing I would look um, look into is just setting, see if we can just set the MathJax font size for uh, our... You can't do it per equation. It's it's a global thing, right? I mean, if, if we could set the no, font size... Can't. If we could just say, always do 100, you know, font size 100%, that would solve this problem. Yeah, so I, I think we might be able to, to do something like that. There's um, this link for scaling math. Um, I haven't looked at how it actually works. <laughs> um, but that leads me to believe that... So they're just in divs with font size. Yeah, they, they put a manual style... Uh, call a style attribute in the actual div tag. It's not done using CSS. Anyway, right. we, if, the, if, font size C, if font size CSS is all you need in the container, did you, did you try that? Oh, yeah. Um, Set the font size CSS for whatever the, the div that we add math jacks to. Or add a new div for you know div dot math jacks output wrapper or you know yeah like no I am pretty sure that would work let me give that a shot okay because that and even if we can't get perfect you know programmatic relationship across them right um, even if you get a sensible uh, default that would and then make sure it behaves somewhat reasonably under zoom yeah. Um, I think that that's probably doable. Okay, let, uh, let me investigate a bit more, and I'll I'll try the the different indentation modes of the the images. So the the second style related PR is starting to play with heading size and spacings. I just pasted a URL into hip or yeah into hip chat. And there's, again, two screenshots. The, the, the newer look is first. The older look is second. The, uh, the, the differences are mainly in the margins above and below the headings. In the previous version, I think the margins were just too big. The other part of it, though, is that the font sizes we were picking didn't really have a any rhyme or reason to it, and so I've sort of normalized that, looking around to try to find, okay, what what are reasonable heading sizes, how far are they spaced, and so in the new look, we go from uh, 32 pixels down to our default size in six pixel increments, which is roughly the type of step sizes that Bootstrap does in its default settings. The only difference is, is that an H1 in Bootstrap is one setting higher than this even. It, it's up at, I think, 38 pixels. I, I felt like that was too big. Um, so p part of what I wanted to do is just get feedback in terms of the style of things, mm -hmm. but there's also some design questions about our, our CSS that are coming up that, that I want to discuss. So I don't know, but first the style. What do people think of the, the style changes? I, I think it's an improvement. Okay. It's, it's an improvement, but the only thing is that I feel like um, it doesn't need to be symmetric with the spacing of the top and bottom because I feel like I want those yes. headings to be closer to the text Okay, that's, that's, that's what I them. in my custom CSS. I I have it's substantially asymmetrical. Right? Okay, 
that the bottom padding is 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 small or non-existent. So one so one challenge we're going to face is that what you're looking at right there has margins of zero. Oh uh, yeah, so you have you set margins to zero and then have padding that's consistent. So that the result is that so in master no, but this doesn't look like that's the case. So it makes sense it makes sense to me to use margins which um, will scale with the heading, right? Yes, the, yeah, previously we were setting margins using M's. Now, the, I guess what I'm saying is all the space between the headings and the text yeah. is coming from the, the uh, not the text properties, but coming from the borders, the padding of the cells themselves. That's, yes, that's but where it's special it's... for heading cells. No, it's just cells? Yes. Oh, it's all cells. So you increased the padding on all cells. No, no. It's exactly the same as it always was. No, it's 10 more pixels on the top. If you look at your changes, you added, you changed the top padding from 5 pixels to 15. Hold on. Did I do something silly? Ah, no, that's on the, uh, that's not on the cell. That is in the overall notebook div. Overall notebook div, gotcha. Yes. The, overall the, notebook there, div. there wasn't quite enough space between the top of the notebook div and the first cell. Yeah. You, you were scaring me there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, that, that seems, okay, that's fine. Yeah, so. So, so to, uh, what I'm saying is I can't bring the headings closer to the text below the heading by decreasing a margin because the margin's already zero. And all yes, the... it's, an, it's an issue with the, uh, the cells themselves. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I can look at it to see if... But if in... We... Oh, okay, no. Yeah, I, it's, it's strictly an improvement. I don't know what, if you want, what you want this the scope to be for this PR? Um, well, I mean, if, if people want the, want the heading cells closer to the text, I think that would be under this. Yeah, I, I think that less, less space below a heading okay. is a thing. One thing is that, that I, Paul was after, right? Yeah. Paul? Paul I should turn on my mic, but yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Less okay. space, okay. The, the one thing I can try is to reduce the line height to one and then add an asymmetric margin. I'm guessing our line height right now is 1.4 or... Yeah, I don't know. Okay. It, l let me play around with it. I, I, I like the idea of having a little bit less, less space below or between the heading and the text below it. So the, the design issue that I'm running into is that the way we set our font size right now is that at the document level, we set a font size of 13 pixels. Mm -hmm. And then in the notebook app div, on the notebook page, we set the font size to 110%, which brings it up to, it gets rounded to 14 pixels. And the notebook app div is not present in NB convert generated output. So it's not present in NB viewer, it's not present in static HTML versions of the notebook. Yeah, this comes to our um general CSS scoping thing, right? It, it, it does, and but I there's, there's sort of a philosophy question about the styling in the actual notebook div that gets exported in different contexts. Yeah. My, 
I, my preference would be for us to have that not inherent from styles higher up the DOM. Mm -hmm. that, that it would be styled in a self-contained manner that doesn't depend on bootstrap. That that's sort of what I'm I'm hoping we could get to. Because I don't, for example, if someone puts a notebook but on bootstrap, a web page, is, yeah, I mean, uh, we we might depend on some initialization of variables in Bootstrap, but I don't think yes. there's any. Um, uh, but I don't think there's our initialization of not even variables because the ipython.css doesn't inherit. Does it? I don't, I don't remember. Yeah. Um, but so if it doesn't depend on the surrounding context, that makes the that makes it harder to embed a notebook with custom style, right? Well, and this is I, I it it would. I mean. Well, well, not, no, necess not necessarily but, crazy hard because you just use RCSS and then include your overrides for RCSS. Yes, that, that's how you. But the the main thing I'm thinking about is. But it means it means you would have to if you have page style, you know, set this font for my page, and then you include some MyPython CSS for um for what um for the layout then you would have to include, again, your CSS with a stricter scope to make sure it, it clobbers all the IPython CSS. Yeah. But the, the main place where this relates to font sizes is that the way we're picking our font sizes right now is always using percents. And yeah. this means we always inherit, which I, I think is a bad idea I think what we should move to is using our font size less variable and doing computations with that so that the font sizes are all hard coded in the CSS, the, the eventual CSS that gets compiled. Um, Rather than doing everything based on percents, which causes the whole notebook to ch change based on where it's embedded. Which seems like a good thing. To me. <laughs> well, the but the the pro well. Well, like if I if I've got my my blog in sixteen point um, Comic Sans, and then I just dump a notebook, I would expect the body font of the notebook to be sixteen point Comic Sans. I mean, that seems like a reasonable expectation. But I, w I wouldn't... It, it, seems, it seems weird to... If I'm embedding... If I take... If I do HTML export of a notebook in the fragment style that doesn't include all the page wrapping, yeah. and then I embed that in my blog with its styling, it seems like the the point of the just the notebook export with just the notebook CSS. Yeah. I mean, right now it's it doesn't it doesn't work quite right. You still need to fix some stuff, but um, that's still the goal of it is for embedding. It should inherit at, at the very least the like prose blocks prose style should be inherited from the surrounding context. It seems, that's what it seems like a reasonable behavior to me anyway. And I guess the, the difficulty is that, or that I ran into here, is that it made it very difficult to style the headings in using the usual way you would style headings in, a, in less. Mm -hmm. Because I had to deal with the fact that, oh crap, in this case, my base font size that I'm inheriting is 13 pixels times 110%. Right. So 
so what um, if you so here's another thing. Let's say you've got um, you do presentations from the notebook sometimes, right? Oh yeah, very often. Do you have like a presentation CSS that makes things bigger? Yeah. So if you got what you wanted, you would have to rather right now if you want to make things bigger, you change um, one value. Yeah. And right. if you got what you wanted, you'd need to change seven. Yeah. It just seems like relative sizing for headings seems like the only behavior that makes sense to me. Okay. Then how about the following, that we manually set the font size of the notebook div? Sure. Well, no, I mean, that'll... I mean, part of, part of what I don't like right now is that we set the, the, the manual font size on the document, on the body. We overrided it at 110%, but not on the notebook div. It's, it's somewhere in between. Wait, it, uh, we, yeah, no, that, I, I agree that that's probably not something we should do. Okay, great. But right, yeah, if, if we think that notebook text should be bigger than the body, or I mean, yeah, there's there's definitely some some messiness in the uh, spilling from the page into the um, into the notebook and the notebook depending on on that spillage. But I I, I think I think Test cases for it, or uh, for embedding a notebook into an existing page with existing style is the main use case to make sure that we're making choices that make sense, right? Yeah. So the the embedded CSS style, the, the ipython.min.css, does that style anything? Any elements above the notebook div? Um, it may, but it shouldn't. Okay, great. So it's, it's <laughs> the the point of it is to style only notebook elements. Great. Okay, um, I, I, that, that's it. It uh, it definitely fails to do that. Right. Um, but okay. It, yeah. Great. So it excludes things like you know toolbar CSS and page. You know, toolbar dot less, page dot less, right? Um, that kind of stuff. Okay, but th this helps me to understand sort of where we're headed, and it, it's outside the scope of this PR alone. But there, there's, yeah, it, it, we'll just have to clean this up. But okay, okay. And anything else? That's it on the style stuff. Are we done, or do we have more things to cover? Uh, well, there's the the NB format v4 discussion. Oh yeah, I pasted a bunch of the the what after last week's meeting. Um, just asked about a kind of what are the actual steps involved in. And before v4, yep. and what need to be coordinated and what needs to be done before what else. So I just looked through the roadmap and and the IPAP and things and figured out what we have and then wrote up a potential ordering of of things to do and some notes about every time you do a v4 change, what should be involved. I don't know if I should put that somewhere other than in the sack pad, but do you think we need an iPad? Do you think that the, the there is an iPad, so I can put it? Yeah, I would. Yeah, but this is this is more a workflow thing than. I, I think the iPad is as good as any place. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'll I'll put them there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, um, what? So, Paul, the uh, IP test fast is in master. You said. Yep, that's been merged. So um, that should speed up your tests about fourfold if you're on a quad-core machine. 
hey, what does it use? Uh, it just uh, creates a thread pool, so we were already creating a new process for every um, group that was run, test group, and so it just runs those test groups in parallel now. Okay. So it's it's and it's not going to be what we use for Travis um, because it sort of suppresses the output of all the tests as they go scrolling by. But it's sort of it's for us. It still runs all the same tests, but it just does it faster. But once things start failing, it's probably easier to just rerun. Um, things individually and yeah. Nice, Thomas. Do you have any uh, updates on the testing stuff? You're you're not on, Thomas. I've started working on it. Um, got mildly annoyed with nose because, like, the nose options. There doesn't seem to be any way that I can find any good way, anyway, to specify them programmatically. Um, so we seem to still be stuck with like Building rebuilding. Yeah. Which is not ideal, but it's worked so far. I'm sure it'll carry on working. But yeah, I'm just I'm like more clearly separating. So at the moment, IP test has a bunch of stuff which actually runs the tests, and then a separate bunch of stuff which uh, controls a sub-process for running the tests. Right. So I'm splitting out that second bit of stuff into a file called IP test controller, and just sort of you know, making it clearer and simpler what's going well, on. Would it make sense? It, it seems like a lot of the complexity in IP test is basically configuring what should and should not happen for a particular sub-package, so what, which dependencies are met, what should be skipped. Do we want to have a way of providing all the testing configuration for each sub-package in a, a localized place? So, so for example, sorry, could, I don't follow what you mean. So, for example, in the for the HTML uh, configuration, the HTML sub package, right now, its testing configuration is spread all over the IP test file. There's not one single place I can look to see how that test should be configured to run. Do we want to create sort of a testing configuration. Sorry, what, what do you mean by configured, sorry? Ah, so uh, mainly, here, I'll... Uh, it, the main things... I'll paste this in so everyone can look at it. So here's, I'm pasting in HipChat IP test. So, for example, um, if you start to scroll down, some of the IP test or some of the HTML module is implicit in the have Jinja2 test on line 156. Some of it is implicit in the tornado, have tornado 155. Um, it requires ZMQ. Um, if you go down... Well, that's, yeah, that's not implicit. I mean, later on, there's an explicit if have ZMQ include HTML. Well, but then I guess there's other things. So, for example, in the exclusions, there's some static and fab file are excluded. And basically... Yes. What, so basically I'm, I'm, unifying, I'm unifying inclusions and exclusions. So instead of having, like one list of what we're going to include and then a completely separate function making what we're going to exclude. It's building up a dictionary where for each for each section of the tests it has a list of things to include and a list of things to exclude. But but I guess what I'm I'm saying is right now all the logic for all the different sub packages are interleaved. And I'm I'm more wondering 
if we could have a single place in the code where I see all the logic for the HTML component. All the inclusions, all the exclusions, all the dependency tests, everything. And then in a separate part of the code, I look to see everything for the core. Because part part of the, the what think... makes Part of what's so. Made... Go ahead. The flip side is that if you do it like that, then you don't have. So at the moment, what we've got more of, although it's in the in the current setup, it's not perfect. But in what I'm doing, it will be better. Is that you can see in one place if I've got zero MQ installed, what does that test? If we, you know, we can reorganize it to do it by package, but then we split up those bits. So you're always going to have something that's spread out. Yeah, I, I mean, the, part of what, or part of the problem I see with IP test is that when a developer is working on a sub package and they change the sub package, there's like, many places in IP test that they have to go look and be aware of. And it's really fragile. Like, it's very difficult to get that right unless you look through every single line of IP test every time you make a change to one sub-package. And I think that fragility is something we have to target. And, you know, we can... If we organize it by sub-package rather than by dependency, we can have code that will print out or have the other information about if you have ZMQ, here's what's run. But I, I think this interleaving of the different packages makes this, it just makes it really difficult for our developers to reason about what, what they need to do when they make a particular change. Okay, I shall have a look at how that can be organized. Yeah, what, Min, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, no, that seems reasonable, I think. I don't know, I'm, 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 anything that makes it easier for us to... Um, manage the exclusions that, you know, since all of us who actually run the tests always have all the dependencies, our exclusions are always, we always need to fix them at release time. Yeah. Anything that makes that easier will, will be great. And, and I, I mean, I, I think the tests for dependencies, there should be a, an object that make, does all those tests and then that object gets passed around to separate objects for each sub package and each sub package can inspect the dependencies and then have methods that return the inclusions, the exclusions, the skips, etc. Yeah, I mean it essentially what what you what I really would want is um, import errors and then just having a list of kind of known if these are not importable skip tests and then just have the nose because a lot of the problem is that the nose walker if there's an import error it raises it right and just yeah, expressing not... expressing if if this module is not importable, that means anytime its import raises an import error, that should just be a skip. Right, rather rather than a... That's what I've always wanted. Yeah, so Fernando says, I think all library checks, the halves, can probably be done in one place since the same checks need to be used over and over, but organizing the construction of dependencies and the rest would be definitely definitely would be easier to follow if organized by package. Okay, sure. Yeah.
Okay. Cool. So, Zach, do you have any uh, updates for us? Zach's not here, is he? Oh. Zach's gone. Oh, Zach is gone. I yeah, missed that. Hi, Kyle. <laughs> Kyle, do you, Kyle, do you have anything? Does my work work? It does. Yeah. Oh, cool. Where are you? Whoa. Uh, I'm at Rackspace in San Antonio, Texas. There's, like, flags and stuff in the air. Yeah, wow. Do you have any uh, updates on the XKCD font? No, nothing <laughs> nothing there at all. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was awesome. Yeah, that was a, that was a funny day. Um, no, I mean, the, the recent stuff that I've been working on, actually, has been um, working at that cookbook for Chef um, to do, like, automated installs and deployments. And uh, somebody from, I think it was Sprintly, Joe at Sprintly, uh, is going to be hacking on that because... Um, he has some sort of R Studio cookbook that he put together, and he wants to do installations for his like data science folks. Um, so we're both working on that. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Not really part of the project, but certainly IPython installs. Yeah, no, it's great to know about. Oh, um, one more thing. Damien wanted. Uh, there's a PR of mine. Um, that I fixed speaker notes. There's a um, he had a PR that added speaker notes, and then I kind of finished that up, and it changes how the serve post processor works. Okay. Um, so the issue with speaker notes, I guess it's because of a WebSocket or something. Speaker notes don't work if you use reveal from a CDN. Hmm. Okay. Um, and so now if you do post serve or now. I don't know if that PR has been merged. Um, uh, at, with that PR, if you do post serve, um, it actually proxies to a reveal CDN rather than just using a CDN URL. Um, okay. And that allows... So the first PR downloaded the speaker notes subset of reveal.js even if a reveal CDN was used. Um, okay. And I didn't like that. So okay. I um, rewrote it to use. Um, so now it starts a tornado server instead of a simple HTTP server. And then it serves reveal from the CDN. Gotcha. Which means that because it's the same origin the uh, speaker notes work even though the, the files are technically coming from the CDN. Gotcha. Um, I, I, had, I, I had no intention of this being a 1.0 thing, but he wanted to ask about, or a 1.1 thing, about uh, the change being a 1.1 thing since it technically fixes uh, speaker notes. Okay. So you, you wrote proxying code. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's a trivial tornado server that just redirects a URL. It's. I mean, they're like 302 redirects. They're not. It's not. Right. Is it 302 or is it? No, it's not. It's. It's actually proxy. Yeah. Gotcha. It's. A, it's a real. Yeah. 302 is permanently moved. But no, it's. It's proxying. It's not redirects. Okay. Um, so, uh, one thing I wanted to just bring up is. The uh, the widget stuff. So and did uh, did anyone? So my did anyone want this in 1.1? 1 .1? Ah, did yeah. anyone want this not in 1.1? 1 .1? I have no desire either way. The PR as it is won't apply because it depends on a bunch of changes. So it would require some manual patching and things. So so are speaker notes in 1.0? No. So well, they work if you. So speaker notes aren't they aren't a feature. It's just speaker notes don't work with CDN. So if you download a local reveal, they work fine. But if you use reveal from a CDN, speaker notes don't work. And what this does is if you're using reveal from a CDN, um, it always looks like lo it always looks like a local reveal if, even if you're using reveal from a CDN. I I'm pretty neutral as well. 
So I would, if, if nobody really wants it, then I would be inclined to leave it since it'll be a pain to backport. The yeah, I, I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I... Okay. Whoever wants it can backport it. How about that? <laughs> yeah, by tomorrow. Okay. So, uh, oh, so are we are we releasing one one tomorrow? Is that is that There's, sorry that wasn't clear to me. <laughs> I, well, the the goal was September first, so and there's two PRs open. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, that makes sense. For that matter, is there anything else that anybody knows of that should be aiming for one point one? Speak now or or forever hold your peace and all that. Or speak now or hold your peace until 1.2. <laughs> Mine sounded better. <laughs> Forever. Yeah. Fernando says okay with me. Okay. Okay. Uh, Kyle, you said there was something related to XKCD you wanted to talk about? Um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure if we should try... If Hosting the font somewhere else. I mean, I can set the or I can set the access control allow origin on that font, um, but we'd have to put it somewhere else. Uh, oh, I, I think so. My my the way I was going to handle that with the XKCD pull request is that I'm going to have the uh, actual font data embedded. In the CSS, in a data URI. Oh, okay. So you're actually going to embed the font in. You're going to embed the the binary font data in the Python string in the IPython. <laughs> no, 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 no. So when when someone enables XKCD mode in the notebook, the Python code will download the font, base sixty four. Oh, encoded. okay, okay. So B64 encode it, shove it in the data URI that gets sent to the CSS in the browser. Okay. So, so the, it, the font data still doesn't. You're not okay. You're not embedding the font data. You're doing that at runtime. Still yes, forward. absolutely. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm not going to ship the font. Okay, that makes. Sense. Yeah, so but, that 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 will solve that problem. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, but, uh, about the widgets, I, I think we should get started on the widget stuff yes. sooner rather than later. Yes. Yeah. What uh, is it really? The message spec, the the first thing we would want to start with. Yeah, I would imagine just making sure that just putting the mes messages in there and the APIs for sending them back and forth. Okay. Um, do you still want to tackle that min or I mean Yeah, I can I can do that. I I mean part of I guess, I guess there's not much there's nothing in the way of I mean I'd be touching JavaScript so I'd probably end up conflicting with SexBR. This shouldn't be too bad though. I I, okay. I wouldn't worry too much about that. His his changes to the JavaScript are not yeah, yeah, I'll look. Up, I'll look up the spec that we have that we've put up on the whiteboard um, in July, and then I'll implement that. Okay, and if so, uh, the the NB viewer update to one dot has been done. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I did that. that um, I did that at Euro SciPy. Okay, because that great. So I'll. I'll work with Jonathan to see what he should work on next. He may... Jonathan, you're going to work on uh, Matthias's uh, NB Convert Transformer stuff? Yeah, that's almost done right now. Okay. And then we, we can just meet and figure out what to do next. But, Min, if, if, if it turns out you want help with some of that stuff, Jonathan could probably help out. So. Yeah, sure. All right. Anything that that? else? Fernando, can you think of anything else? Wait. <laughs> One, do, 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 do. Your call is important to us. <laughs> <laughs> to 
you. Yeah. So I, actually, one one other thing I I, I can provide a, a brief update on. Um, Min and I have been talking with some of the uh, NThought folks about IPython Parallel, and uh, there's a few things we're thinking about adding to IPython Parallel. One is uh, an object that would run on the client that would proxy an object living on the engines. Um, this is sort of a, a design pattern that's coming up and so that, that's one thing we're thinking about, and uh, that would be used to, to build distributed objects, like a distributed array class that lives split amongst the engines. And then the other thing is to generalize the algorithms that we use to in gather and scatter to split containers between, between the engines and to gather them back. Um, and some of this is based on the this old uh, IPython dist array project that uh, I did back in I guess 2008 as part of a NASA grant. Um, and so we're going to be working with them to try to figure out what what abstractions IPython parallel should have. They're going to be building on top of that um, in, in, a, in a much bigger project that that sort of Pi spark, that's how pi spark objects work. Um, through a proxy or through a like map objects which split the pandas data frame. Ah, so nice. So, so we should probably look at pi spark to see how they're doing this type of proxy. That's a great data point, Fernando. So it, it, it's just an ongoing discussion that I wanted to let people know about. Okay, is that that? Yeah. Looks like that about wraps it up. All right, guys. Good seeing everyone. Yeah.